Let's stand and open our Bibles this evening to Genesis chapter 15. I appreciate you coming back tonight. Appreciate those presentations, the faithfulness of those that are serving around the world. Genesis chapter 15 tonight. I want to just do a Bible study and talk about faith. I believe faith promise works. If you have faith, then you make a promise. Amen. And uh, I believe it's based on faith, so we want to touch on that for a few minutes. Really, I think the question of the night is this, before we read Genesis 15. Is, are you satisfied with an Ishmael? As we go through the life of Abraham, I want you to be patient with me tonight, because most of this message will be introduction to the question. And then at the very end... I'll again ask you the question. Read with me, starting at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy great and exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said to him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said to him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. When the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. He said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. Let's pray. Father, I pray tonight that you use what we've already heard. And Father, what a blessing to see what's happening around the world. Father, knowing that those that want light can have light. And Father, you've sent Brother Hearn to the mountains of Nepal. To people, many without any light at all. And Father, there goes a missionary with tracts and a Bible and preaching the gospel. And our work's been started. And Father, we're thankful for Brother Allen and everything that's happening in New Guinea. And Father, those you're raising up and sending forth and... Father, I pray even here in our midst, surely there are future missionaries. Some that have yet to surrender and others that need to just make public their commitment. And Father, we pray for those that are here tonight holding the ropes. Father, those that have been faithful, they get up every day, go to work and live in a wicked, perverted society and just stay faithful. And then Father, every month, they sacrificially give. We're thankful for them, and I pray that you'd continue to bless this church. They're giving, and Father, help us to do more than we've ever done before, knowing that time is short. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In this chapter, we see that Abraham asks the Lord, what will you give me? And God repeats his promise. Not just a large piece of real estate, but a son. And then he makes a pact, a covenant with Abram. And Abram kills these animals. And as they're laying out there in the hot sun, the carcasses are there. The fowls, the birds, the vultures are coming down. And Abram has to pick up a stick and beat them away. And let me just say this. If you're participating in missions and you're stepping out by faith... You better be prepared for attacks. 
The just shall live by faith, but that's not as easy as it sounds. You make a commitment, you make a promise to God, you determine in your heart, you want to grow, you want to live by faith, and then you can expect emotional attacks and physical attacks and spiritual attacks. And Abraham was facing these attacks. Matter of fact, look what it says in verse 1. After these things. After what things? That's after chapter 14. A great battle and a great victory. The Bible speaks of a coalition of kings. Four kings that had come together against Sodom. And conquered that city. And taken great spoil in the people. And when Abraham heard that his nephew Lot was taken. He got together his servants. Can you imagine what that group looked like? Can you imagine Abram as he's getting them together? 318 men against a great army of trained soldiers and saying, arm yourselves, men, with what? Whatever you can find. A stick, a broom, a knife, a club, a rock. Just grab something and let's go. And they stepped out by faith and God gave them a great victory. I don't believe it was because it was a surprise attack and well, it happened at night, and you have to understand the strategy. No, I believe it was Almighty God uh, showing himself merciful and strong on the behalf of Abram and his faith. And now Abraham comes back, and he lays down worn out. But let me ask you this. How well did he sleep that night? Because it says after these things, after that great victory, he puts his head on a pillow, if he had a pillow. He went to go to bed and he couldn't sleep and he found himself tossing and turning and thinking, what did I just do? Boy, that was stupid. We just went and fought a great coalition of kings and armies and when they realized it was only a ragtag bunch of servants, 318 in all, that came and conquered them and then took the spoils, surely they're going to seek revenge. Surely they're going to come back. Here's what I need to do. I've got to put out guards and, and we're going to have to station men out and, and, and put out some dogs and, and have our best servants begin to go through some kind of military training. We better hide our women in caves and we better do something to protect ourselves. I don't think he slept that night. He says, after these things, God had to come and calm his nerves. Let me just say this. One of the first buzzards you're going to have to battle when you're going to make a sacrifice and step out by faith is the buzzard of human reasoning and logic because God's going to stir your heart and the Holy Spirit's going to move and you're going to say, I'm going to step out by faith and you're going to win a battle and you're going to do something by faith and when you lay your head down on your pillow tonight or tomorrow night, maybe, maybe even Sunday night after you make your faith promise and logic is going to say, what did you just do? You, that's a big step, and you made a large commitment. And financially, I don't know if you're going to be able to pull this off. You should have thought this through a little better. How are you going to come up with that kind of money? Don't you realize prices are going up, income is going down. You may lose your job. You're going to have less in retirement. You can't get a new Car, matter of fact, forget the new car. You can't even replace your tires or do proper maintenance on the vehicles you have if you make that kind of commitment. Be careful. Because always after a great victory, after a step of faith, in comes a buzzard. And after these things, now here's what will calm these fears. The word of the Lord Cain. Now, when you take a step of faith and you're attacked by a buzzard, the first thing you need to do is grab this book and beat away that buzzard. Thank God for the Word of God. And I love these new apps on the phone, the Scripture apps, because, preacher, there is nothing. The longer we live in the ministry, the more complications there are and the greater the legal liabilities and everything involved in pastoring. There is nothing like the comfort of the Word of God. And just about I the time I feel overwhelmed by a conflict or a, an attack or some kind of problem and fear uh, overwhelms me, I love to put on that Bible app and as I drive down the road, uh, that fear just seems to dissipate. And it says, as 
Abraham lived there. He didn't have a Bible app, but he got a direct word from God. God came and spoke to him in a clear voice, saying, fear not. There's the command, Abram, don't, don't be afraid. Now look what he says, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Abram, I know things look terrifying. I know they could come back and seek revenge. But listen, here's what we're doing in great fear. I'm not getting it, insurance, but we have health insurance and life insurance and car insurance and every kind of insurance that you can imagine. We're petrified. Baptists are building bunkers and buying ammo and stocking up on silver and gold and buying 50-gallon buckets of wheat. What are you going to do with 50 gallons of wheat? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> Try to eat a gallon of that. You have lost your mind. You know why? That's a reaction to fear, and God says... I am your shield. Uh, Abram, go to sleep. Don't send out another servant. Don't put out a guard. Don't worry about the dogs. Don't hide the ladies in a cave. I am thy shield. Uh, and we need to remind ourselves of this promise in 2013 because we're looking at all the circumstance and everything that's happening around the world and concern and worry. Listen, there are good Christian independent Baptists that need medication just to go to sleep at night. God in his word wants to remind us, I am thy shield. Now listen, Abram's two biggest fears are still the two biggest fears of our generation, security and wealth. Now let me ask you this. Did these men ever come back? Did these soldiers ever seek revenge? Did Abraham ever pay a price for this step of faith? No, because God said, Abraham, just how many nights have we missed precious sleep with a comfortable mattress in the room temperature? Absolutely perfect. Everything's in our favor except for the spaghetti that we ate too late. And the acid reflux we're suffering from. But everything else is in our favor and we still can't sleep because we're concerned. This is a generation that, listen, it's forgotten that God has not given us a spirit of fear but a love and a power and a sound of mind. How many Christians don't even have a sound mind? Because they, not because of sin, but because they took a step of faith and now they're concerned about my security. God says, I am thy shield. Uh, I am thy reward. Why did he say, I am thy reward? Go back to chapter 14, verse 21. Because, because when Abram had conquered these kings, the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. He is the one that will meet my needs. It's not my boss. Now, let me remind you where he is living. He's not living around the corner from Walmart, and he doesn't have a steady job nor steady income. Uh, he could use this. Oh, by the way, let me just remind you, when this was written, he was 85 years old. That's when a man ought to be thinking about his retirement. So when you have the spoils of a city that are being offered to you, much gold, much silver, cattle, camels, oxen, sheep, that is your 401k, Abram, that you are giving away. And he says, I will not take from, he said, not even a thread, even to a shoe latchet. Don't even give me your shoelace. I don't want it. I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, IBM has made Abram rich. You better be careful. You're a little bit unsettled about your retirement. And let me just say this. I have seen way too many people in my lifetime. They sacrifice and they work in overtime and they don't go on a vacation and they do all these things so they can accumulate wealth and enjoy it when they're 70. And then when they're 70, they just enjoy getting out of bed and functioning. 
Enjoy it now. I know kids don't like this. Go spend their inheritance. Make them earn what you earned. Don't wait till you're 68 to go to Yellowstone. Go now and let them know I am spending your inheritance because you are my retirement program. You'll get more serious about rearing them properly. I've looked at my children and said, our church doesn't give me a 401k, so you are my 401k. I'm taking you on vacation now, so down the road, you get to take me on vacation. And I pay for everything now. The other day, my son bought a truck, and it, it went to pass inspection, and a couple of the tires fell. And I said, Sonny, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to buy your tires knowing that the man that soweth reapeth. So I'm thinking if I sow two, you'll sow four. Just saying. And here's what this 85-year-old man said. Uh, I'm good. But when he walked away and he laid down that night, he said, what was I thinking? And some of you are going to make a commitment and then you're going to say, financially speaking, your wife's going to roll over and say, you did what? You didn't consult with me about that. And you're going to toss and turn and say, that was for a year, and I've got to keep that commitment. And here's what God said, Abram, I am thy shield. I am thy great reward. But that's not enough. The fact that he's our comforter and our guide, he's our provider and our protector, you would think that would be sufficient. I mean, he took good care of Abram, even out there in the middle of nowhere, when he had sold everything left to her. But he said, I am thy reward. And Abram said, Lord God. Now, this is a demonstration of faith because Lord, capital L, small O-R-D, that's Adonai. That's the master, the owner. So don't, don't think for a minute that this was really a lack of faith, but it was a show of great faith. Now, let me ask you this. He wouldn't have asked this at 85, a common person or even a doctor. You don't go to the doctor at 85 and say, Doc, um, when are you going to give me a child? You're going to say, I'm sorry, I don't got a pill for that. He's 85. Sarah is 75. And he said, Lord, master, owner, sovereign God, what will thou give me seeing I go childless? Now listen, he had been waiting for a while, several decades earlier when he left Ur and then Aaron. But when he left Ur, we're talking about possibly 25, 35 years earlier. And he had told Sarah, listen, here's what God told me. He said, we're going to leave. He promised a large piece of property and a son. And Sarah, being the great woman and shopper that she was, she went out to Babies are us. <laughs> I don't need you looking at me like that, young lady. She said, they're not babies are us back then. <laughs> they had little babies are us. In, now, the shop had a hut door and who knows what inside. She went down and got clothes and shoes and a baby crib and all the supplies. And she was happy telling her friends. Can you imagine, women, telling your friends and neighbors and parents that God has promised me a child and you go baby shopping and then two years later, like, uh, you might want to go on a diet. <laughs> I think that was just weight gain. <laughs> what do you do with all that stuff after five years? Ten years, you're dragging that stuff around and now you're humiliated. And now you're convinced to maybe, who knows? So Abram says, Lord, what would thou give me seeing that I go childless? And then he looks at his steward. He likes the guy, but he says, you mean to tell me I got to leave everything with Eliezer? And Abram said, behold to me, thou hast given no seed, and lo, no one born in my house, mine heir. And behold, the, oh, here we go again. Don't you like how God just comforts us with the word of God? And he says, the word of the Lord came to him saying, 
This shall not be thine heir. Don't worry about that ugly fellow that serves you night and day. You're going to have a son. And he takes him outside at night. And he brought him forth, verse 5, abroad. Look now towards the heaven and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. Now, you've got to remember, he's out in the middle of nowhere in the blackness of night. I was just in Alaska and out there in the wilderness. Boy, I'd never seen so many stars in all my life. You could literally see the, the Milky Way. It must have been. I'm not a scientist. I don't know. But it just seemed like you could see forever and the light was, and, and the stars were just dancing in the night air and I'm sure that's what God did for Abram and he said count and once he got to 438,000 he said how many more and God said count and he kept counting and at some point he got tired and God said okay I want you to understand something do you want to keep counting Are you listening I'm listening Lord Amen. your seed will be greater than the stars of the heaven. Did you get that? Pentecostals aren't the only ones that dance. I guarantee you get a direct word from God and this is the promise that he gives you. That 85 year old man suddenly felt like now it might have been a slow dance. How in the world does an 85 year old dance? Maybe the finger dance. But he was happy about something. Verse 6. Now, this is so key. What was he excited about? And he believed what? In the Lord. Now, the source is important. Because for many years, my son seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, he used to say, Dad, you know what? I'm going to buy you a Hummer. You know I never walked around telling people, my son's going to buy me a Hummer. You know, this Suburban has a lot of miles on it, but I'm not that concerned because my son's going to buy me a Hummer. <laughs> I never got happy about that because the person making the promise had no income. <laughs> he still has very little earning potential. No, in my life, if he told me that promise in 2001, in 2041, he'll keep his promise when that thing isn't worth anything. But when God told him this promise, when it was Adonai, the Lord, the sovereign master, owner of the universe, it says he believed in the maker of that promise. Isn't it amazing when God says, I'll supply all your need according to my riches and glory? Oh, I mean, I hope so. He believed. And the person who made that promise is counted to him for righteousness. Aren't you glad for imputed righteousness? Amen. It's not the message. That was just free. And he said to him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth, the counties, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, wherever I shall, I know that I shall inherit it. And he said to him, take me a heifer of three years old, a she go to three years, a ram of three years, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Don't you like when God speaks the fact that he speaks specifically now, Abram did the smart thing. He didn't ask questions. You know what the average independent Baptist want to know? A three-year-old heifer? How am I? I don't even know if I remember which one is three years old. And a she-goat of three years? Now, is this random, Lord, or... You better be careful when you pray because God may just get specific with you. You better be careful when you come down here to the altar and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? He may give you an exact number to the dime. And you get up and you say, ah, it's a coincidence. You know, I, sometimes I just get a number rattling around in my head. And then it won't go away. And then it starts to scare you. Take Now, you know what this was about? This was about a covenant a blood covenant. Now, here's what I like about God. God had no obligation to meet Abraham on his terms. God could have said, I made you a promise. Believe it, son. But God said, here's what I'm going to do. You need something visual. This is a Middle Eastern. Uh, I'm thinking of the word in Spanish, and I can't. Custom. This was a Middle Eastern custom to, to make a blood covenant. And he knew as soon as he started mentioning animals and a heifer uh, that he was going to go out there and make a covenant with Almighty God. Now, in this day and age, covenants mean very little. 
If people will stand up here and make a solemn vow on a stage in front of God in the congregation and say, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. And six months later say, you know that covenant we made. <laughs> I don't think I want to live with you forever. But this was a real pact. Matter of fact, it was so serious. When they would take those animals and divide them in two, they would grab each other's hands and they would walk through those carcasses in the midst of those carcasses. And there was a bonding that was taking place. And they would uh, talk of the requirements and the rights that were included in that covenant. And by walking through that animal that had been torn asunder, they were saying, if either one of us break this vow or this covenant, let us be torn asunder. And God was stooping to Abram's level. God didn't have to do that. But he said, Abram, I just want to reaffirm your faith. Aren't you glad for the moments and the times in life when your faith starts to shake a little bit and God said, okay, Let's go get an animal, let's part it in two, let's walk hand in hand through this and I get you to remember once again, I am faithful. The problem is not my faithfulness, Abram. And just like we do so often, look at how Abram managed to fail in the middle of the covenant. Because verse 11, he took those animals. Verse 10, he divided them in the midst. He laid each piece one against another, but the birds he divided not. And the fowls came down, so here come the buzzards. And he has to beat them away. That's what will happen when you go to make a sacrifice. The buzzards are coming. That's guaranteed. How many ever deal with the buzzards? How many deal with them the week after missions conference? How many ever had to deal with the buzzard the night of the faith promise commitment? So he makes sacrifice. Here come the buzzards. He's waiting on God to do something. In verse 12, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Now let me ask you this. In the making of this covenant, what was supposed to take place? They were supposed to grab hand in hand and walk between the divided carcasses. There's only one problem. Abraham made it all day. He was chasing around the chasing the buzzard. It was hot. He was dehydrated, worn out. There was a horror of darkness, and he fainted. God showed up. He said, Whoa. I thought you wanted a visual aid. <laughs> and you didn't even make it. To walk with me through the covenant. But here's what I'll do. I'll just go ahead and walk through and make the covenant with you. Because this really doesn't depend upon you anyways. It depends upon me. So while he lay there passed out. God said, don't worry, Abraham, sleep on. In the morning when you wake up, you realize, I passed on through. Aren't you glad? I remember in Argentina when we got the news that Ashley... Uh, her heart was undeveloped. And the doctor told us, he said, uh, that it, most likely she has Down syndrome and we're going to have to do emergency surgery to save her life. And that was a sucker punch. We went home 2 o'clock in the afternoon, in the middle of the day, and I don't do this and I don't take naps. But that day I laid down at 2 o'clock and I didn't wake up till the next day. I thought about... We didn't have a vehicle, and, and just getting to the doctor was an hour away, and we had a little baby son, and my wife would climb on that bus. you got to understand, she was 8,000 miles away from her family, from her mom, her, her, her dad, her in-laws, her friends and relatives, and climbing on a bus. Now being told by a doctor, that child that you're, you're just about ready to have may not live. And the buzzers begin to come, and I... I I hate to confess, but you're not looking at a super Christian here. You're looking at an average, ordinary, common person that's probably less of a Christian than many of you in this auditorium. When those brothers came, I began to say, God, you know, we, we are serving you. And I don't want to be angry and I don't want to get bitter, but God, there are people out there that mock you and Laugh at your holy name and God, we don't even have enough support to live here. God, I can't even buy a car. Why would you do this? 
And then she's born and they do the surgery and it's not good and she's infected and she gets pneumonia. We listen to her breathe, take her back to the hospital. God, if, if we're sacrificing everything, laying on the line, preaching the gospel, trying to do right, and then you're going to take our daughter? A whore. How many of you ever faced a whore of darkness? How, how many of you ever stepped out by faith, and then when you did, you were rewarded with cruel fate? Or you get laid off. There's a cutback at work. It's quiet in here. I'm just telling you the truth tonight. This is what Abraham was dealing with. And he passes out. But look what the Bible says in 17. It came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, the smoking, smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, God kept his promise. And let me just say this, the supernatural has nothing to do with man. Don't, don't ever think you actually had something to do with supernatural. This is God saying, I'll make the covenant. I'll keep the covenant. You don't have to worry about anything because I'm the one that's in charge. Let's fast forward. So here's Abram. Still had not seen the boundaries of the land that was promised to him. Still had not seen a son. I'm sure people were asking questions by this point. Abram, so tell me about the, the child. Where's the boy? Abram, tell me about the land. How's it look? Abram, you mean to tell me for three decades now you're still hanging on to that promise? Come on, Abram. Well, there's a problem. Abram had chased away every buzzard that had attacked his faith. Human logic and fear and doubt. But there was one he didn't do so well with. Look what it said in chapter 16, 1. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing, I pray thee... Go into my handmaid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And look what happened. Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And Sarah, Abram's wife, took Agar, her maid, the Egyptian. Let me just say this. And we're getting closer to the point in the message. Because really, I've noticed a trend in Christianity, a trend where... We're satisfied with the talents and the abilities and the work ethic and the programs and the methods that we have. And now we're proud of the fact that we have produced an Ishmael. So everything else that he had withstood, every buzzard that he beat away, now he's using words of discouragement that came from someone very close to him that said, I'm barren in... Abram, I want you to think about this. Logically speaking, God gave us this handmaid. Yeah. Amen. You're about ready to take Egypt's route. Yeah. Amen. Egypt's solution. Yeah. Yeah. You know what Christians are doing? Yep. Go ahead. In the average church, the average ministry, I'm not talking about just the Sunday school, the missions program, the giving, the buildings. What we're producing in today's Christianity, 90% of it is Ishmael. And she said, it's not even wrong, it's not even wicked, this is probably God's plan. If you take Agar, that's the custom of the land. God can still bless us with the child. She can conceive a child for me and everything will be solved. And so he went and Ishmael was born. And this is most of faith promise giving. Let me talk to my wife and let's figure out a way to produce an Ishmael. God's not involved and there's nothing supernatural involved. We are so content with the natural. God doesn't even have to be involved. 
We're so content with what we can do, what our sacrifice can do, what our planning can do and our programs can do, that we begin to birth Ishmael after Ishmael and we draw a crowd and say, look at what God has done. And God said, not really. Are you satisfied with an Ishmael? That's what you produce. That's what you plant. That's what you're satisfied with. But that's not what God has put together for Abram. He had something supernatural in store. But look at this. Verse 7, chapter 17, verse 1. When Abram was 90 years old and 9, God stopped speaking to this man for 13 years. And the average Christian doesn't even realize God has stopped speaking to him because they're so happy with Ishmael after Ishmael after Ishmael. Preacher, look at it. We just had another Ishmael. We just had another baby. We just had another baby. And God says, I, let me know when you're done with Ishmael. Look at verse 18 of the same chapter. 13 years later, Abram's still saying, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. His hope is still in Ishmael. Uh, and that's Christianity. Oh, look at what God is doing across this land. And God is saying, hold on for a minute. If you did that in your talent and ability and programming and planning and power and scheduling, and then that wasn't me. That was you. And Abram, are you really satisfied? And Abram knows this isn't going to work out. This is why his prayer is. He still has hope in Ishmael, but he's saying, oh, I wish Ishmael would just be the solution, the answer, the son. But he's beginning to realize that was something he produced, not God. Isaac is rare because Isaac is supernatural. How little the supernatural is actually taking place even in the spiritual realm or even at missions conferences. This is the day and age in Christianity when we rejoice in the natural. We rag about it. Here's why. We don't understand what God really wants to do. Look what it says in chapter 17, verse 17. Then Abram fell on his face when he received this promise. And laughed. He's 99 years old. He said in his heart, shall the child be born unto him that is 100 years old? Shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? Chapter 18, verse 11. Now Abram and Sarah were old and well stricken in age and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Are you understanding what God is trying to highlight here? You're talking about a man and a woman. 90 and 100 Sarah was old. Here's what God's trying to highlight. Old and well stricken in age and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. And that's why when the promise came again, Sarah laughed within herself. And said, a child? I barely have the strength to hang on to the table and make a good meal. A child? That would kill me. I could not survive the second month. Matter of fact, I would kill someone that wanted me to have a child. It would prematurely end my life. What are you talking about, a child? I don't think that's high on my priority list at this point. Or moment. That's not. <laughs> I don't have the strength to laugh. But I don't believe that's a possibility. God is trying to highlight this in Scripture because God was trying to tell them my plan was never an Ishmael. You can do that. How many 40-year-old Egyptians have had a baby? God said, that wasn't me, that was natural. I want to do the supernatural. Chapter 20, so he does. 
And Abram journeyed from thence toward the south country. You can understand, okay, this woman is 89, nearly 90 years old. How many understand that? So how quickly are they journeying? Okay. You don't just drag a 90-year-old woman on the back of a horse or a mule at 20 miles an hour. So they're plotting from village to village and town to town. And as they come upon this town, there's a little dissension going on between the husband and the wife. Because Abraham looks as old and as rugged as ever. But his wife is looking hot. That's a biblical term. That, can you imagine that desert, that heat, that sun? <laughs> How would you look if you weren't traveling in an air-conditioned car? You would look hot as well. <laughs> but there was a king, Abimelech, Gerar, and when he chose women, he did not choose 90-year-olds, but rather... The hottest. You don't like that term. <laughs> the good looking, attractive young women. And Abram says, I don't know what kind of supplement you've been taking. If it's coconut oil or mango juice, I don't know if it's the roots or the berries. But you're sliding and gliding again. And that perturbs me because I'm not. You say, Pastor, you're making that. I'm not making this up. It is right here. Don't tell me a king is going to look at a nine-year-old woman that just laughed at the thought of a child that the Bible called old and well-stricken in age. Now, according to the Bible definition, and God does not lie, no king is going to look out to the window except to laugh and say, how did they get out of the home? <laughs> Send them back. But when he looked out the window, he whistled and said, wow. That's in the Hebrew. Now, we know something was going on before they ever got to the city. Abram is already telling her, you're my sister. Would you be concerned about a woman that's traveling with you that's 90 years old? <laughs> he just traded her in for a younger model that was Egyptian. But the king whistled and said, You, my lady, need to come with me because you are fine. <laughs> there is no other explanation for the king wanting an 89. You say, I don't believe it. it's in the, it's in the Hebrew as well as the Greek. <laughs> Go to, you don't believe me. You think I'm making this up? Hebrews chapter 11. I am not making this up. No wonder this is the first time I preach this. It's going to scare people. You think I'm I have to throw this out of my missions conference series after tonight. I had the preacher looking at me cross-eyed. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. Now, that's not talking about strength at the moment. Folks, you don't just carry a baby for nine months with the body of a 90-year-old. She receives strength, so while Abram is feeling more feeble, Sarah now is cooking again and bringing in the wood. <laughs> and Abram is suspicious, saying, I don't know what kind of money you're spending on those things, but it's working, so spend on. 
She was receiving strength to conceive seed, was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged in favor and promise. Therefore sprang there even of one, look what the Bible says, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. God said their bodies were as good as dead. Well, God supernaturally did something. Something so special that a king whistled. That's supernatural. <laughs> now let me ask you this, and we'll be done. If you don't chase away buzzards, you're going to be satisfied with an Ishmael. You walk out of this missions conference, and you'll have an Ishmael. God, once again, will sit back and say, it's nice, but I really wanted you to see Isaac. Have you ever known Isaac? That means there's no hope. Who against hope believed in hope. Romans 4, we didn't even go there. So let me ask you this tonight. God's not even interested in the natural. He said, I'll just let you guys take care of that. But I'd like to do the supernatural. But that won't happen. If you're talking and looking at some humanly possible way to have your own baby, God says, I'm going to let you guys take care of this. I'm going to go do something bigger. Because there are still a few people that want an Isaac. And kids, be careful because I've seen this happen. We'll be done here in just a minute. I've watched kids get all excited and they go to college and their career is in Ishmael when God wanted them to see an Isaac. And they get in a hurry and their mate is in Ishmael and God wanted to produce an Isaac. And I've watched people miss out Folks, I can't tell you about the last 20 years and the 15 years in the mission field and the miracle after miracle because I used to tell those stories and I don't anymore because I just sit and watch people look like you're making things up. I gave up on Americans. I just gave up. Because we don't even believe in Isaac anymore. We believe in what I can produce. And I got a handmade and I got a plan. My wife's behind it. Look at my Ishmael. And God says, Boy, I'd like to give you an Isaac. Father, we pray tonight. God, you help us really, really make a clear decision where we say, God, I. I don't want to do something that I'm producing on my own, uh, excluding you. God, I, I want to do something that you can be honored and glorified with. I want to see the supernatural. God, I pray that through this church and churches all across America and our church in Austin, that God, you would do the supernatural. The Father, you would raise up young people and call them to the field and through them do the supernatural. In Jesus' name.